to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal. Protonic Reversal with your host, Conan Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rotten about music, rock and roll, and corporate power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with sharp and nails. Confidence of a hero or a fool, I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's all It means something. You know, that's my take on it. Like, what's yours? Protonic Reversal! That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed it is. It is a science thing. It's a science place. It's a scientific fact. We're all up in your face this time once again for the one, the only... Protonic Reversal! Welcome to it, welcome to it, welcome to it. Additionally, welcome to it. And tonight's special episode. Uh, 314, episode 314. Mr. Mike Watt returning. Uh, such a pleasure to have him on. He's coming on again, uh, and this is, uh, it's always momentous and awesome to have Mike Watt on. Uh, it's been almost three years since I had him on last. Isn't that crazy? Uh, there's a new Mike Bagata, Jim Keltner, Mike Watt record called Every When We Go that you may know this band from Mainstream Stop Valve. They put out a record, a Live Flowers record, end of December 2019, and then um, another record uh, under that name in October 2020. Now just going by their names, but uh, the, the reason why is because it's this is more collaborative, right? So... Anyway, I, I kind of got this confused in this episode. This is a rare episode that is pre-recorded, and it was pre-recorded because Mike Watt likes doing these in the AM, and I get a couple things twisted now and again on it because, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't had my coffee yet. But anyway, as some of you know, this show is 99% of the time broadcast live. This is one of the rare times that's not, so this is what happens. And uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm mentioning that because I'm not going to edit it. I'm not going to edit it. You just get to hear me screw up, and that's fine. I like that part of the process. But anyway, we're going to talk to Mike Watt shortly, but let's get right down to it. Welcome to Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. I'm your host, Conan Neutron. I'm a rock and roll lifer who has toured and recorded for over 22 years. going to be 23 pretty soon. Most known for the band Conan Neutron, The Secret Friends. Music is a huge part of my life, and I use the format of this long-running podcast to talk about music with musicians whose work I enjoy and respect. Folks that may or may not be household names but do something very special. This is episode 314. If this is your first time listening to the show, all the archives are at protonicreversal.com and are always free. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. If you'd like to support the show and get episodes sooner, you can give $1 a month to patreon.com slash protonicreversal. And if you like the show, or even just a single episode, please feel free to share it along, like, subscribe, or post a review. All that helps people find the show, and it's just a darn nice thing to do. All right, so yeah, let's get down to it. Mr. Mike Watt. Mike, welcome back to the show, man. Man, thanks for having me on again. Once more, brother Conan. It, it, it's been a hot minute. It's been, it's, it's been a bit. As they say, a little bit, a <laughs> so, little bit. Some things. Well, you had some music too. We talked about that. You had me on your show, which was which was That's an honor. Right. I, uh, I appreciate it's that. It's so big for you to be uh, mutual. <laughs> I I wanted to uh, have you on to talk about a uh, uh, mainstream stop valve. I think this is this is real interesting, and I I, I think that uh, folks... uh, I don't, it's mainstream stop valve. I think it's Bagetta, Keltner, and Watt round two. Yeah, and and this this popped up. Uh, MSSV, MSSV. The big difference is the drummer man. Yeah. Also, the the band runs. Yeah, with MSSV, Mike Baguetta writes all the parts. And, and that's with, a different. Uh, it's 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 not yeah, how you normally. Yeah, because here's the timeline. I met Mike Baguetta 
at the recording session for Wall of Flowers, which is where Jim Keltner was, where I met him. So that was a few years ago. So we did that when it was mainly improvised. There were some tunes that we ended up doing of Mike Geddes, but a lot of it was improvised. When it came to tour, Mr. Uh, Keltner is an older man now. So we got Steve Hodges to tour with. And that ended up being its own band that we ended up calling MSV, Main Stadium Stop Valve. But it's it's kind of a different band. You know, Mike Baguetta writes all the bass lines from as MSV. That's the first time I've been in that situation. Not even D. Boone wrote me bass right. lines. <laughs> right, exactly. It's a it's a new uh, it's a new trip kind of. Uh, yeah. So in a way, what this was. It was a year ago, this no, last November, so 13 months ago. It was kind of a round two of that first event mm-hmm. with Jim Keltner, Mike Baguette, and myself at Big Ego C- Studio with Chris Schlarb producing. Now, he also, Chris Schlarb also produced the MSV record. Right. There's two of the uh, members in the same bands. I could see how easily it's, you know could be confused, but they are different. It, it gets a, you know, the way that, the world operates now. I think it's real hard when you have a lot of information to throw at people. Some people catch like you know ten, twenty percent of it maybe, and then the, they're off the races. So it's it's good no, to have but, the but, No, but I think it's important. The way Mike Baguetta put it to me was he want Hodge to feel like second class. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, of course. I mean that makes that makes sense. So by that saying that sense. that the MSSV is its own proj, I mean it did it did come along got a practical thing right where. Jim Keltner couldn't tour, but it became its own baby. So that's what I think Mike Begut is looking at that big picture. Uh, so how did you, how did, how did, how did you meet all, all these guys? Cause there was a contemplating well, of the engine room with Hodges. Right? The way it came around was Chris Schlart. What? Okay. Here's the way Mike Begut explains it to me. Okay. The wall of flowers thing, right? Three, four mm-hmm. years ago. Yeah. My, my, uh, Chris Schlaub is just starting a label to go with his studio, Big Ego, in North Long Beach. And he wants Mike Baguetta to be one of his recording artists. And Mike Baguetta told me, he told Chris Schlaub, look, you get Jim Keltner and Watt, and I'll, now I had no idea of this, okay, and I'll make a record for you. So I've already done stuff for Chris Schlaub. I know him through Nels Klein, and I guess he had some connect with Jim Keltner. So he brought it together. We got to, we're going to blame anybody. We got to blame, well, Mike Baguetta for making the wish, but Chris Schlarb for making it so. Right. So that's how I meet him. I meet him the day that we do the record. And it was a pinch shitter, man. At first, Mike Baguetta, he had scored a bunch of music. Some of this shit was like changing meter every two bars and, i mean it was like <laughs> stravinsky kind of shit yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> and I, pk lock sweating bullets trying to do good for him and, and so is mr keltner you know totally focused and then mike says fuck this i got a couple riffs we can jam on and then let's just improvise and see what happens and that's what becomes wall of flowers got now it. what actually happened was we had too much for wall of flowers and Mike Baguetta, actually, when we were doing that first tour with Steve Hodges, which Jim Keltner couldn't do, so Steve Hodges took the place. He went and mixed all that extra stuff, made tunes out of stuff. And then Jim Keltner, when he liked it, he said, but he said, look, if we're going to do another record, let's do another record. And that's why this round two, every When We Go, I think it's called, that's where that came. That, that's where that came from. Okay, so now a couple things. First of all, Keltner, yeah, uh, he's like he was like one of the big time sesh bro back when, right? It, um, no, an incredible. Uh, the way he had me understand it was Leon Russell brought him out from Tulsa, yeah, and first uh, helped out Joe Cocker, right? Mad Mad Dogs the Englishman with uh, Jim Gordon. There was two drummers actually, and then you know because Leon Russell came out to do sideman work with the piano and stuff. And so that's how he got in there. Yeah. And he meet, meets the, the Beatle guys and you know, he yeah. ends up playing with all kinds of cats, Steely Dan, right? He's, he played in the, with the Wilberries. He played in those, uh, uh, dangling uh, dingleberries. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Yeah. I mean, um, you know what I, they call that in Italy, you know, I play with two Italian guys. They call it 
<laughs> Tar- Tarzanelli. You know, like Tarzan, like swinging from the ropes. Yeah, that's what they call fucking dingleberries. Yeah. Uh, and like, and Rykooter too, man. I mean, that's that, and that guy's no joke too. I mean, that's, that's Rykooter, like, yeah. Well, well, you know, and he, and also he turned into a producer and stuff, and songwriter. Yeah. And Jim Keltner's amazing man. I just turned eighty, brought in his own drums, set him up himself. You know, just beautiful cat, no chip on his shoulder. One of the most beautiful cats you want to play with. You want to. Like, I come in there, you know, here's something trippy about this second session. Mike Begetta actually asked me to bring something in, so I brought in a song. Oh, cool. So I asked one part, it's called Yank It Out, and I I asked uh, Mr. Keltner, what about this part here? He goes, Mike, whatever you play makes me feel good. Oh. This is the kind of guy he is. Like, I I just brought back the, the, the Blue Thunderbird I hadn't played, I don't know, 18 years, you know, since the first yeah. Stooges reunion gig yeah, at yeah. Coachella. And I got it back together. I put in a old fashioned Fender pickup in honor of us losing Dusty Rhodes, you know. And he looks at that bass. He goes, Mike, I'm a drummer, but if I played bass, I'd play one like that. <laughs> and this awesome. is the kind of guy this guy is. Yeah, yeah. Some people treat music like sports and they're going to go toe to toe with you and shit. This guy, he just wants. You know, to make it happen. He just likes playing and he's into yeah. the things to do it. Yeah. Is that, hey. out, finding out the possibilities, seeing what can be done. He's just, he's that way, man. He's just incredibly uh, generous with his uh, focus. And, and like you said, his experience. Yeah. Does, that, does a guy coming from that world, like just uh, coming from like making so many records? I mean, not that you haven't made a lot of records yourself, but kind of seems to me like uh you just might be coming at it from a slightly different place and uh yeah you know, the ideas that but come out might be a little similar somebody similar it's still yeah. music it's still being the side mouse it's trying to help somebody realize their thing what, what? It, it's similar you know it's, it's, it's uh, conan it's kind of that thing like with genre i'm really getting away from that and music's music yeah. and yeah there's years that separate me and mr keltner 17 years but in some ways Kindred spirits. Yeah, and when you get it cooking, you get it cooking, right? So I mean, yeah. there's the, that's hard to Absolutely. argue with. We got to give Mike uh, Baguette and Chris Schlarb credit for that because they set up the sitch, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and as you said, this is the first the first thing where it's it's like there's parts written rather than everybody you know right. grinding it up in the kitchen, so to speak. Uh, right. And him asking me to do one was very kind of him. Yeah, d- I found out. He just wanted some bass line. You know, it's still trippy about bass guitar as a composition tool. People right. are still hearing, oh, give me a bass line. Right. You know, they don't hear verse, chorus, bridge, intro, outro. You know, they're just, here, give me a bass line. Yeah, like, yeah. You don't yeah, hear that. Yeah. Here, give me a string of chords on the piano or give me a string of chords on the guitar, you know. But with the bass guitar, it's give me a bass line. <laughs> Well, that's okay. We're all slow learners. Uh, it's the future of the bass guitar, though, Conan. I don't think it's eight, nine, ten strings. I think the future of the bass guitar as 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 a composition tool where it's first, because it doesn't contain as much harmonic materials, for example, yeah. guitar or keyboard. So you're leaving it open for your collaborator. This is where a guy like Nels Klein loves it, because yeah. you leave them more room for them to bring in their own ideas of what the harmonic harmonic should be. And kick, some dudes hate it. It's like, why? Why didn't you write the fucking song on kick drum or cymbals? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not I, enough for them. But I, that's like Nels Klein. They love it. I, if I can just interject real quick, when I do my demos, a lot of times I start with the bass, and one of the reasons why is I want to make sure I'm not just hogging up all the space with guitar stuff. It's it's real easy to do. To it's easier doing guitar. Yeah. You can still do it on bass. Don't get me wrong. But you do compose with. Because when we were talking, I didn't know you you spent some time on the bass, okay? Yeah. I know you play everything shit, but you actually go first with the bass. I yeah. think that's a great thing to do. I, actually, what about going first on the drums? I, I do that as well, but I'm a, you know, I'm you a pretty know, pissed. Hamilton, you know, Hamilton could not get songwriting credits because they said drummers can't write songs because the notes don't last longer. That's, yeah. Bullshit. That's BS. I mean... I do. Let's put it this way. I do my best with that. I mean, compared to compared to Dale, like you know, I'm I, I you know, I'm like, I'm like a kid in the uh, in the music store, like pot, with pots and pans. But uh, I, yeah, I, I think it's a lot of guitarists, especially 
could use uh, from a songwriting exercise um, if they try to think about it in terms of the other instruments and think of it like a foundation, like a house, like coming together or something. Like you don't start yeah. with the furniture. <laughs> you start by pouring well, the cement, man. <laughs> or, or let's talk about a boat. You start with the keel, That's right? Good. Yeah. And then you need a bow. You need a rudder. Yep. You need a hull. I mean, you, you know, it takes a lot of parts, right? It, it, that's why they call it an ensemble. Yeah, you, and you're right, a, a composer that could look into the future. Now, the way when I'm composing on the bass, I'm not really looking at the finished tune. I'm looking at more set up a situation like, here's the diving board. Here's the right. launch pad. Yeah, yeah. What is to be done? You know, so I'm actually trying to set up a situation. And I think that's what Mike Baguetta did this time around. Yeah, so when he comes at you uh, with these bass lines, do you ever be like, huh, that's, I wouldn't have well, thought Well, that's with that. MSSV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, so with that's, but that's what I mean. Here, with this project here, the second Baguetta, Keltner, Watt album, he brought no bass lines. And you just, and he you only did your thing, right. Our parts, yeah. And so he would play the guitar parts for us. Well, two of the compositions are totally improvised in the moment. It's another one-day session, right? So... A couple of them, he brings in just guitar stuff and has me and Jim Keltner respond to that. One of them, he has me show my co uh, composition just with the bass line. They respond. And then two of them, we totally just, let's try and make up something together. Right. But with that, with the first, with that first record, with him coming in and he had bass yeah, parts in mind and record, stuff. Record. It's called Wall of Flowers. With Wall, yeah, with Wall of Flowers. Wall, yeah, Wall of Flowers. Yeah. Other than... Like Stooges or Flipper, you know, like that's not a thing that you normally do, right? Like oh, that, that thing, that thing, uh, like Stooges or Flipper. You know those usually songs. When Everyone I, knows when those I, songs. When I help somebody out, I have to learn the parts of the guy that's dead. Yeah. It wasn't like that in this case. Yeah, well, <laughs> sure. But well, I guess I guess what I'm driving No, but at. usually it is. Usually it is, right? Yeah. Usually I'm taking the place that, of the cat that's gone, and so I'm going to help out, right? Like, I, I guess what I'm getting at is on that first record, was it, did it take a little time to wrap your head around what he was doing versus, uh, versus how you do it on that? Because you don't have the advantage of having these classic records to listen to and knowing what a band's, like, all about. Like, it's more of a, more of a, not a blank slate, but a, but a, a slate that's uh, got some stuff on it already. Well, like kind of direction, right? And then he, like I said, like the launch pad di uh, springboard thing. He he's setting it up to see what will happen. Right. He's trying to uh, provoke a situation, right? Yeah. yeah. He's not he's not asking for people to march in line. He's he's like throwing it out there, you know. And then now you guys have, and you you got to tour that out a, a good amount, right? So and you've got a kind of a better handle on how how it all fits oh, together. The, Actually, I have I have some history with Steve Hodges. He's the drummer on my first opera, Contemplating uh, the Engine, Engine Room. room. Yeah, I know. yeah, I love it. Love that record. I know that one well. So I, I got to tour with him then, too. But yeah, it was 25 years later, and I toured with him again. <laughs> I never got to tour with Jim Kelton. I probably never will. But still, yeah. uh, it was, you, you're right about having some history. Being, being the second time in the studio, for one thing, not as scared, you know, because, like I said, the way this guy's uh, character is, it's very inviting. It's very, uh, it's not belligerent. It's not competitive. Right. But that that helps a whole lot when you're creating. You know? Big that, time. I, There's a lot of ego in a lot of music things, especially when they're playing the name game, you know, and they're just putting projects together based on who knows who, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. I don't think... Yeah, it was doing that, but it can get into that weird kind of just hype, right? It has nothing to do with the, the rhythms and the notes. and Yeah, members of blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. Emerson, Lake and Palmer. <laughs> right, right, right. And yeah. so, you know what I mean? It's just a bunch of, you know, it's not who you blow, it's who, or maybe it is who you blow. <laughs> and who... <laughs> Well, it's and and the reason I, I've kind of harped on the process a little bit on this is because uh, it does like when I first no, I heard it's it. Good you brought it up. I think it's real good you brought it up because I think people get cynical. They think it's all about managers just putting together name games. Yeah, and and when I first heard the the, the first record, I was like, oh, this is interesting because it doesn't. It does sound a bit different. Like it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound exactly like a Watt record. You know what I mean? And no. no. And even Mike Baguetta, you know, obviously he's from the Nels Klein School of yeah. Guitar, but he's got his 
thing. He's got his own thing. The review, they're always mentioned in surf. I hear that too. Oh yeah, I can get that. I can totally get that. Uh, but he's a Western Massachusetts guy. But you know that guy in Canheed who knew all the blues, right? That 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 owl singer guy. He was from Boston. You know, Sly Stone says, it's not where you're from, it's where you're at. So why can't a guy from Western Massachusetts do surf? Why hey, not? man, uh, Fogarty is from the bayous of El Cerrito. It works out fine, right? right? <laughs> West Bayou, right. And Beach Boys are Hawthorne. Yeah, yeah. Close exactly. to the water, not on the beach. <laughs> uh, you know what? Would the first That's to your neighborhood, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I think that, Okay, so so the the band that it first kind of reminded me of a, a little bit, not exactly in sound, but in feel, was in the Mystetics. Uh Brendan Canty and Joe oh. Lolly from Fugazi. They got a band. Uh, right, right, with, uh, you know, uh, MSV got to share the stage with them in Baltimore last tour. Oh, no kidding. That's awesome. That, well, yeah. I got to see their thing. Yeah, this, the guitar man, right? Anthony, uh, Anthony. What a, jeez. Oh, right. What a really walk. good. He's kind of from this Nels Klein school too. Yeah, because he's got the same Nels, vibe. Yeah, totally. Uh, Klein <laughs> opened the door for a lot of cats. I, I mean, and what a great player, right? But yeah, it's it, you know, other guys too. Bill Frizzell, Mark Verbo. I mean, there's a lot of these guys around. And, but but it's a good thing they uh, they don't have to live up to the cliches of the old arena rock guitars, you know. Yeah, yeah. They can play whatever the fuck they want. Ava Mendoza, uh, the, uh, Lady Mike Baget has been. Uh, uh, doing some duets with same thing, yeah. Th th like the, all the doors are open. They don't have to play jazz fusion. They don't have to play Jimmy uh, Page. You know, they don't have to play. Uh, well, everybody owes Jimmy Hendrix, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but but still, the free they can let the freak flag fly. Nels Klein really kicked that hatch open. You could do Sonic Youth. You can do uh, you know whatever you want. Yeah, it's really really interesting what they've. But he let happen on the guitar. First time I ever uh, heard Nels, uh, this this is like years and years back, right? Way before uh, Wilco and all that. <clears throat> I was like, no, it's kind of like with what Sonic Youth does plus like <clears throat> jazz. And like I, and that was my, my elevator pitch for it. But I meant that in, in as broad based as that is when you're talking to punk rockers, you know, I mean, like, no, you got, no, you know, you know, him and his twin brother, Alex, was trying to get free music happening in SoCal because they're from here, right? Yeah, yeah. This thing in uh, right on the border, West LA in Santa Monica called the Alligator Lounge. And he would have this thing called New Music Mondays. And every Monday, he'd let some freaky music play, but the, Community just and they did for years. Just wouldn't support it. He marries to Yukahanda, moves to New York City. There's buttloads of support for it there. Yeah, they. they but he's just been a true believer, you know. And he just he told me he first learned from uh, Jimmy and Yardbirds. I mean, and the Yardbirds there was some, are great. There was so. some kind of jazz <laughs> island. He told me in the seventies, but then he said Sonic Youth like turned his mind around. Yeah, I mean, if you really think about guitar. As a you know, and, and like where you can push it, where you can go with it, man. The the combine and it's Thurston and Lee both together for me. It's like it's how yeah, they interact. Exactly. It's how they. Well, you know the first sea nails. It's D Boone gets killed, and I'm doing one of my first gigs with Firehose at McCabe's, which is near this area. It's right up in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. when you cross over. Yeah, S and M. Big heavy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, opening uh I before I we have our gig the week before I go see Bobby Bradford in uh with Nels Klein in Charlie Hayden's Liberation Orchestra. And Nels is playing Spanish nylon string guitar acoustic, which Dee Boone loved to play. Yeah. So when I saw him do this, I said, Will you open up? I'm gonna be here next week. Will you open up for me with this new band I got? And just play that solo acoustic? And he said, yeah. And that's the first time I got it. it was really him not doing a D Boone imitation, but kind of just kind of evoking that thing of my long lost friend, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's that's music, really beautiful. That's why music so special to me, Conan. It's because I got into music not really as a musician, it was to be with my friend. So when stuff like this hits me, it hits me right in the heart. Yeah, no, I, 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 that, and that, I feel that, and you hear it in the music, and it's that's deeply appreciated. You know, I saw that, uh, I saw that Desolation Center documentary real recently, like a couple weeks ago, actually. 
and so oh, it's like, I didn't matter in the mojave yeah it and it 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 kind of just occurred to me like how much of that stuff has sort of disappeared from history and how much of it is like you know the stuff of DIY legend and, <laughs> and stuff like that uh, and i love you know, like, I was just thinking about, like, that footage of you fellas out, like, on the boat, playing on the boat, going in the harbor, you know? that's I Oh, yeah, that was the second one, right. It was called, uh, what'd they call that one? Yeah. It I, had a name. I, I, I'm forgetting what it is right now, but I, I just love. I, yeah, it, it fucking had a kind of name because Stuart Sweezy rented a boat. We sailed around the harbor with the meat puppets <laughs> Yeah, and you kind of get just going back and forth, right? Mojave Desert, but then the, the second one was actually off Pedro in the harbor. Yeah, it was called Joy at Sea. Th- there you go. It was called Joy. At sea. Yeah, but that but and the, I, and I, it's in the We Jamie Cano yeah documentary. Yeah, yeah. It, it's and well, I Stuart, did, right. he, he was doing gigs at the Anti Club, and he just thought, you know, the way that a band in the punk movement would write wild songs, why not have wild places to have gigs? Yeah. Mojave Exodus, man. <laughs> right. And, and right. Uh, yeah, and that's crazy. You had, like, you know, you had Sonic. You had uh, uh, you guys, Meat Puppets, uh, Neubauten, one of them. Um, Pear, when Pear first came to town, he had a band called Psychops? Uh, Psy, 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 Psy. Oh, uh, Psychon. Uh, is that Psycon? Psycon. They were called Psycon, and they were, I think, at the last desert one. Yeah, that's right. With they, the Red Cross. Yeah, I was on Minuteman was on tour during that, so we get, didn't get to see that. I yeah. think the Olympics were on that summer. Yeah, so we wanted to be out of town. We were touring double nickels on the dime. Yeah, and I think Red Red Cross uh, barely made it in time. They got they got lost. I remember hearing that from uh, Steve McDonald. See what Stuart <laughs> did was for us. He rented two school buses. Yeah, we came there on a school bus. You could see it in the middle of a double nickels on the dime. When you open it up, you could see it playing. We also used the school buses as a windbreak because it was in the middle of a fucking dry <laughs> lake bed. People don't realize People when that wind kicks up, man. Hot up in his eyes and shit. Yeah. yeah. When that wind kicks up, it's uh that's that's real business. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> yeah, he took me to that place to talk about it when he did the documentary, and yeah. I hadn't been there since then. And it was a trip. It was like, wow, we did a gig out here. <laughs> yeah, it's got it's gotta be a weird kind of time travel when you when you do stuff like that. Like I mean, I mean I'm even yeah. thinking about like places I've played like twenty years ago that you know, Highland Park yeah. Bowl, right? That used to be Mr. T's Bowl. It was like a death trap, practically. But uh, yeah. Actually, what was his name? He was killed oh, by uh, wrong way drivers. Jack Cinder. Yeah, and and that's right. Fuzzy Land. He called it Fuzzy Land. I mean, it was Mr. <laughs> T's Bowl. Mr. T was an old Sicilian guy. Yeah. I mean, it was a real bowling alley. Somebody told me they turned it back into a bowling alley. They did. So it's called a Highland Park Bowl now. And it's they put they sunk a lot of money in it and they change it looks like a it looks like it looks like a movie it looks like Disneyland or like uh, it's it's a trip man and of course I played a block away there's gigs now at a Freemason Hall upstairs about a block away from there it's a, it's it's around the corner yeah I know the place you're talking about yeah, yeah. Uh, it, but it's it's like the Jazz Festival last year uh, the, the whatever it was called Southern California Jazz Festival with the Matoko Honda Petra Hayden and uh, Joe Berardi. Yeah, had, you got to bring your shit up in the elevator, but it's an old Masonic call. Yeah, I mean that's an old neighborhood. It's probably seen such changes. It's just wild because you know one uh, one of the times we played we played there, and uh, a bunch of folks from back in the day came out, and every one of them had like you know like looking around like, oh man, this is crazy. This looks so different because you know that was a. The nice thing about Mr. T's man is they just let anything happen. They didn't like really care, you know. They would... uh, you know the av- uh, the neighborhood around there had the abs and shit. I yep. mean, that was heavy. It, it was, was real heavy. You had to watch your watch your back. We should tell the people abs. It was one way, so you'd have to turn around and come back. It, it was very dangerous if, if you were out of town. Or, yeah. yeah, if you if you missed if you missed it, then like you suddenly feel like you're in a maze or something. It's uh... yeah, <laughs> and, that, and then gentrification comes and. The, who's the uh, comic guy had me on his radio show? Mark Marin. Yeah, he lives yeah. up there, and it completely changed. It's 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 very. I went to now. York Street. I played a club on there. It was an old warehouse, pool hall. Now it's some, you know, whatever. Yeah, things change, right? That's the only thing that stays the same. The only constant. <laughs> uh, 
can we so man so since you've been on this show I just realized yeah. it's going to be it's almost 3 years like so a lot's happened like yeah. you you we we mentioned flipper you playing with those cats like hadn't even really right, happened right, then. right and I was about to do a tour before my knee got blown out that's right I had to cancel the tour as a power trio we did five gigs. It yeah. was really interesting playing with them that way. Because I talked to yeah. Steven earlier I on. It. I he, love he... both those guys. I love their songs and stuff. But I got to get this knee fixed. It's just too dangerous. In two weeks, two and a half weeks, I turned 65. So Medicare, right? So yeah. I'm going to get things happening then. In the meantime, too, I've been doing what from Pedro Show. I've been doing lots of collabs, trading files over the internet with my little Pro Tools set up here. Uh, so music's been a lifeline for me. I did that... Uh, MSSV tour in the spring. That was 48 gigs in 48 days. Yeah. It's uh, a lot. 12,580 miles. I drove every one of them. You know, I can't really schlep, so I did all the wheel. Yeah, yeah. Wheel man stuff. Uh, real careful. Never got any of the sickness. Uh, four, four shots, you know, trying to be careful. It's, it's, uh, it's a crazy time yeah, to be touring, man. Yeah. Like, it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, but, you know, it was time to do. If, if we're careful about it, it's possible. Yeah. You know, that's the whole thing, you know, thinking about each other and caring about each other, not just getting off of these wild ass shits where people are just yelling crazy shit at each other. Yeah. Like I heard about this asshole wants to get rid of the constitution. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to go down that um, route, there's all people yelling crazy down, stuff. Man, yeah. You know, be a good loser. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so, but what I've been doing is music now. I, I'm working on a new Missing Men album. That's I've got awesome. seven songs with Tom Watson, but Tom Watson fell down and cracked, uh, put cracks in his pelvis. So he's healing up from that. <laughs> Missing Men are coming around. Yeah, you know. Everybody's got an little, injury. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> more brittle as we get less younger, right? So yeah, yeah. we're working with that. But, you know, work within your limitations. You could do it. And so Tom's coming back around. At least, like me, he's still got his hands. Yeah, you know exactly. It's not gonna stop from playing. About the legs, yeah, if the legs get fucked up. At least you got the hands. You can work the instrument. So I'm doing that. Uh, I'm working on a second uh, stovetop, uh, three layer cake record. Stovetop was the other one with these uh, avant garde musicians back east and stuff. Uh, uh, I'm also putting bass on uh, Cutthroat Brothers. Right, I put bass on three of their records. I'm, I'm putting on a fourth one now. Uh, working together with the head bobble man uh, Derek in the East Bay. Uh, Sam Lock Ward in Iowa, I made two records with him. I'm almost done with the third album with him. Yeah. Uh, you know, internet, you can do a lot more than just spread lies and hate. You can actually collaborate <laughs> with people and get going with music, you know. Yeah, you can actually There's do some something good with it, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, hey, you got, show, you got shows like and this. That, and that tour I do, Conan, will probably be in the fall with MSSV because Mike Baguette is writing a whole new batch of tunes. The yeah. new the album that we did, it, the fact that last tour we did was a great idea because we didn't tour before the tour, we toured after the tour. Yeah. So we got everything done in one day. Right. <laughs> and when you instead of doing it the other way around, yeah, you talk about good prac, forty eight straight gigs. So that record's going to come out in the spring and we'll t uh, in the fall rather of two thousand twenty three and we'll tour that. But at the same time, we'll be working on. Songs for the third MSSV record. I love being Mike Baguetta's bass player. It's it's a trippy thing. And like I said, this idea of a guy writing new bass lines, that's never happened with Y. Yeah, it's a, it's a new experience, and you get to have it. It's like a new challenge, right? But it's a new opportunity, too. You know what I just got done? I got, just got finished with uh, uh, a fourth seven-inch for the Stooges. Me and Larry Mullins, the guy I did the last two years of Stooges touring with, have putting out these seven-inch instrumentals of Stooges songs to celebrate them because we love that band so much. We just did one for TVI. So that'll come out Record Store Day uh, 2023. You know, everything's catching up because of the situation and stuff, especially the press implants. Yeah. You know, and especially because people want vinyl again. Which is great, but everybody wants vinyl again, so there's only so many presses. There's only so many... I know. Things will catch you up. Things yeah. will catch you up. Uh, you you know, know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, you know. Uh, sometimes things don't happen. You know, here's the thing. People get used to their fucking remote control with their television sets, but that's not real life. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very, it's very true. <laughs> it's the button. doesn't mean the channel's going to change. You know, things got to be happening, right? Of course, the world taught us, right? 
So no wine before it's time. <laughs> what of those commercials? <laughs> those commercials. I think that's the last work he did. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> that's a, those are great, man. But Chuck throwing caps, right? Yeah. And he's just totally, he's like lit up like a Christmas tree the whole time. <laughs> man, he's, he was a big man. I mean, not yeah. just wide, but tall. He was at Pink's. You know about Pink's in Hollywood, right? on uh, Yeah, yeah. Melrose. Of the hot dog pets, it's forties, right? And it went, you know, I found out because there was a club there called Blackies, right? So I used to see gigs there, and uh, I found out about it. one time I'm getting chili dogs there. There's Orson Welles; he's got chili dog in each hand, and I go, <laughs> Wells. He goes, young man, I would shake your hand, but I am busy. <laughs> <laughs> and he was huge. Those chili dogs, you know, they're pretty big, man. They look like little <laughs> fucking Akimaya Wiener whistles in his palms. That's a, I can I can totally hear it in that voice too. That's amazing. Yeah, young man, of course, the Shakespearean. He was beautiful. He looked me right in the eye. It wasn't like a shine on. It was good. Yes, he was big as a barn door. He oh was yeah, huge. well of course, yeah. There, there's a dude, there's a dude I know uh, from this movie show that I co-host, uh, Joe McBride. Uh, he's like a historian biographer. He did a book on the Coens. He's done like all kinds of stuff. He's uh, written a bunch of uh, movie stuff. Rock and Roll High School. He, he like wrote Rock and Roll High School, right? Um, wow, really? You know, in that movie. You know they filmed the, the the band scenes at the Roxy. You could see Darby you, around the side of the stage. You, to- yeah. you totally can. But the, but the other thing, yeah, he's in. Um, he knew Orson. He he hung with him and uh, oh wow <clears throat> for a long time. Like he was, he was like a legit like friend of Orson Welles. And he's even he's even in that uh, that other side of the wind movie that was like that. It didn't they didn't was com- wasn't completed for like longest time. Oh, he was wor- working it for I years. I think the last thing was F is for f- fake. Yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> Girlfriend, yeah, yeah. But that other Which side, I like. yeah, I, I do too. Fake is great, uh, but it's uh, it, it's wild because you know he had a lot of people around him in in, in his orbit, and uh, and uh, Joe McBride, he basically is one of the one of the reasons why Other Side of the Wind ever saw light of the day because it came out finally in 2018, and people were yeah, able to see it. Problem was funding, right? Because yes. that that racket takes so much bones to make records, yes. uh, f- films, works. And he said, I remember him. One quote was, "I have an unfortunate personality." <laughs> it's conducive to fundraising. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nobody wanted to get yeah, that point. People were like, "Oh, he's you know whatever. Who wants to give him money for I that? Waste yeah. money and shit." Like like uh, why they uh, they didn't want Francis Ford Cobb. Coppola to have Marlon Blando, right? He's going to waste your money. Right. <laughs> Which is amazing because, of course, who can even Nate picture that? Film, him? right? He ended up being the man. Yeah, exactly. One of the all time great roles. And it's like, hey. Absolutely. <laughs> you know why you see a lot of back of Robert, uh, a lot of uh, Robert Duvall's back? Because he's got the spiel taped to his chest. Marlon wouldn't <laughs> fucking memorize his lines. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but your buddy Joe. McBride probably knows about that. <laughs> well, I was going to say, the only reason I'm invoking Joe McBride is because uh, what he did those commercials, the, those, <laughs> those wine commercials. Uh, yeah, Paul yes. Masson, yeah. He, he, was, Masson, just... he was trying to, Paul Masson. Yeah, he was trying to yeah. r- raise money uh, to make his movie. He, he was trying to, ra- yeah. you know, just trying to keep the lights on. So, right. so it's sort of like it's easy to, to be like, oh, man, he's he's loaded and he's. <laughs> Doing these line reads and it's it's really fun. and it is, yeah. but it's also like it's, it's a little sad because he's he's hustling to try to to you know try to make the record and try to make the movie. <laughs> it was a means to an end. It wasn't just to serve a lifestyle. He really had, especially his Shakespeare shit. Right, he really yeah. wanted to get those movies made. Never got to do. Oh yeah, Chimes of Midnight is amazing too. Like, why wouldn't you just let him do whatever he wanted with that? You know, just <laughs> you know on. what? I think it was because, well, I think. Making that first film got Randolph Hearst really pissed. Yeah, yeah. And so right, right away, he had enemies. And then you know the the the, the, the amazing whatever Ab- Ambersons or shit. He goes with Rita Hayworth to have their honeymoon. He doesn't finish. Yeah, I think it was. But he was like in his early twenties. You know, isn't that crazy? That was like his uh, debut record. Us, <laughs> man, we're twenty. 20- years old right darby's 22 when he kills himself we're just kids yeah and he was only 23 think about it you know 
it's you learn by doing, you know. So, yeah, some fatal missteps maybe when he was more younger. He's a re- you know not just as a director too. He was a really awesome he actor. As a radio man. He yeah. starts as a radio man. Yeah. Uh, as a and as an yeah, as an actor, he was really fantastic. I mean, if you think of the. Uh, um, uh, what's the movie? It's got the zither on the soundtrack. It's the uh, uh, God. I love it. Why am I blanking on it? It's uh, it's about so, um, well the worlds. He got that whole hoax the, going. The Carol Reed Creed. movie, uh, Third Man, the Third Man. Oh, like, Third Man, right, right. I love that. Uh, I mean, right. That's got his buddy Joseph Cotton too. It does, yeah. And and he was uh, he was incredibly skilled you know that, as an actor. That 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 that, that merry go round is still there. I'd love in Vienna, to see it. Oh, I God. played a gig right next to it a couple of years ago with Tab Falco. Oh man, I would I would love to yeah, see that. That's, you know what else is excellent about that movie is the soundtrack, and he accidentally met that Zither guy outside a cafe. Is it that wild? <laughs> and that dude is like <laughs> loud too. I love it. I love it. And he's like in the movie, and like everyone's kind of watching him play the Zither. <laughs> For years after that movie, that dude toured on that. Soundtrack. That's awesome. <laughs> that's man. That's the dream right there, right? <laughs> yeah. right? Orson Welles sees you playing outside a cafe, and all of a sudden you got, you know, five years of touring looking out. Yeah. And the, in the soundtrack too. I mean, like it's he's it's saying. all zither over the uh, that incredible ending of that film. It's all zither just going. You know, it's 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 a trippy yeah. thing. It's really loud and really raw. It's, it's a great. Great recording. See, he comes from the outside, so movies are. He, he's not. Oh, this can be done. It's like let's see if it can happen. Yeah, you know, he was a total petri dish man. I love it. Very, very inspiring. I think of when I try to do music. I think of Orson Welles. He's really a balls up against the walls man. I, I, I dig it. He did definitely. He did things his own way, for better or for worse, and sometimes it was definitely right, for the and he worse. Was worried about airbrushing his image. He plays the corrupt cop in uh, Touch of Evil. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Shit. Another. Great he didn't one. care. He thought it was right for the movie. That's right the, for the art. You know, he wanted to bring the art. That's the way to do it. Hey, um, Stephen, uh, Stephen, from Flipper. Uh, I, ha- I had him on the show, and it reminded me that I hadn't had you on the show since Flipper. Can you talk about uh, taking up with those guys? You had those trio shows yeah, playing. Yeah. Now, the Minutemen played with them in 1981, so 41 years ago. That's a lot. <laughs> That's awesome. Up in, the city, up in their town. And uh, to me, they were one of the last of the 70s punk band, where yeah. nothing against hardcore or anything, but after 1980, you kind of could tell – what was going to happen before that you couldn't really, what was going to happen. And flipper was kind of part of that. You couldn't tell what was going to happen at a gig. They were really trippy, uh, and very inspiring to us. Minute man. Uh, uh, of course for me, the songs are all built on bass lines. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Of course. Yeah. It's, it's, it's yeah you know, well, cause and Ted Falcone is such an interesting and, and guitar also player. The words are good and, and just everything, the groove, Ted, Ted Falcone, one of the most imaginative guitar players. Oh yeah. Like he's love the way he plays. and, and Steve Deposh, you know, incredible groovester. I love playing with him. You know, he's still playing the same drum set he had back then. That's what he, he was saying. Played. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's so great. You know, Why not? And he plays them grooves and stuff. And I mean, I mean, I really had a good time. You know, I did a tour with them in Europe with David Yao singing. it. Yeah. So I played 16 gigs with them in 2019 summer. Yeah, that's that's a good crew, man. That's a good crew. So yeah, yeah, it, I I really it really broke my heart, but my, my I'm just hurt. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no much that what can, you got to heal. Yeah. You have to heal. That's all there is to it. How did how did you end up uh, hooking up with them? I mean, obviously you knew each other from back in the day. Did uh, like the yeah, I knew them as you know peers and fellow musicians and stuff. But uh, Steve wrote me this message: uh, "What you know, you want to help me and Ted, me and brother Ted got David Dial aboard." And I was like, "Fuck yeah, yeah. fuck yeah." With bells on. <laughs> exactly. That's that's a no-brainer, really? right? <laughs> you know, in a way, a bass player, you know, that's one of the things we can do. We can, you know, aid and abet. Yeah. You know? And, and you know, and people are, oh, you're going to ruin the band. You're going to play too many notes, what? And it was like, no, I ain't. 
<laughs> well, you know, you, you get in the room and you play with the band. You don't have the band come and what, you know, attend me flatter. There's a Shakespeare line. I mean, you know, I'm in there <laughs> yeah, soaking yeah. it up. First, I soak it up. I played all the records buttloads of times, right? And then I get in there. In fact, I had him play at my prac. You know, I've had the same prac pad here in Pedro 38 years. So come on here. Prac with me. And uh, they're way into it, way into it. And, uh, you know, just to make them happy made me happy. You know, I, and I, I really, I loved it. I loved it. It's, and I, it, it really broke my heart. I couldn't do it. But when I get well, you know, let's see. Yeah, yeah well, absolutely. And, and that's a band that it's so cool to see them existing again. I mean, I know Ted Falcone from the Bay Area. Like, I know him from uh, just around, right? And even those. You know, you know, he went to Vietnam twice. I do know that. Yeah, man, it's it's he's an interesting he just, cat. He just turned seventy five. It's wild. I mean, he's and he's an inspiration. I love it. Nobody I plays like it. him. No, there's nobody that plays guitar like Ted no, Falcone. No. Nobody. And that was the whole idea of the movement. Everybody was supposed to play like no one else, and you know we all had a chance, right? Because a lot of the cats in the movement were just learning how to play. Yeah. Uh, Ted, Ted went, went to art school and stuff. You know, he was telling me he ended up learning synthesizers at Mills right. College. <laughs> Which I used to live by. I used to live by that. Well, you know, the people got to know this because I think they think all punk rockers are retarded and shit. And actually, especially in the old days, a lot of them weren't retarded at all. Neither were the Stooges. None of these, just because you're simple with your motifs, or they might not contain. Uh, Contain a lot of confusing elements. I don't mean the people, you know, working them are fucking retarded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a real bad assumption. There's a there's a difference between you know, simplistic and stupid. Man, Ted Falcone, man, you could talk to that guy for, and like the Stooges guys, right? Ig with the culture, and Ronnie with history, and Scotty with nature, and Brother Steve with politics. Brother Ted, you could talk to that guy about astronomy or, or politics or what, you know, signal corps in the army, whatever the fuck, you know, yeah, a peace movement. Yeah. Real yeah. interesting dude, man. He is. He was, he was great. In the show. I was trying to, I've been trying to talk Ted into coming in the show. He started but. writing me when I started playing him with him. Yeah. Bruce loose. Oh, really? And man, <laughs> he writes some emails. Now they're not as lucid maybe. <laughs> right. Right. But they're, they're still interesting. You know, that's how it was about the old days. All the, and, you know, and Chip uh, Kimman, he just came out with a new record where he talks about he, t uh, he talks about one song, Hanging Out with Will Shatter. Yeah. He said, 1977 in the city, Mike, you wouldn't have believed it. I mean, there wasn't a lot of money, but the, he said there was something excited about that time, being part of the movement right when it was beginning. Yeah, man, it's there, there's something I've. I've Asked Ted to be on the show a few times. It's not really his bag, though. Like he doesn't. He's like, ah, Stephen's better at that he's kind shot. of stuff. And yeah, I'm like, yeah, but come on, because I mean, I actually know him. You know, know him, know him. Like, and it's like, just do it. Come on. But I keep, I keep he's asking. I keep asking. To talk to right because usually it's me and him driving in the boat. Right. So I spend hours with that man. Yeah. Out, and it's just incredibly interesting to be with. Uh, so then. Yeah, so when you're doing those, does that just like slot right, slot right in pretty easily? Because flippers, it's so it's so interesting because it's like it's almost like alchemy, right? Like there's a thing that happens with with flipper that uh, yeah. if you take away just the constituent parts, it'd be like, ugh, that's horrible. But somehow, like all it all comes together and it's perfect. It's amazing. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's but it's I think I, it seems like it could be more delicate on the inside to a certain degree. Like you got to kind of hold the angle because you know the center has to hold right. Yeah, uh, right, and, right. and a lot of that's built around the base. <laughs> I yeah, mean, feel yeah. And they used to switch off Bruce and Will. Yeah, because one, one guy yeah. would sing and the other guy would do bass, and then they'd switch. Yeah, that that, that whole band very interesting, and and, and you got to say this: the tunes are timeless. Yeah. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. If anything, they really fucking good. Yeah, they weren't stuck in one moment, you know. And 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 actually, you could have other bands play them, but of course, it sounds. good really righteous when flippers doing them. Yeah, exactly. It's nothing's going to sound exactly like them no. <laughs> for sure. So is that with, I, brother, Ted, with brother Teddy, the important thing is the temp tempo. And I believe him. Yeah. 
That's interesting. And this is what they got shit for because things were going into hardcore in the early 80s, so they wanted them to play faster. And that just ain't the way those songs are. No, it, it, it robs them of their power and, and what makes them yeah. interesting. The only fast song is that one, Brainwash. Oh, Brainwash. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is great. It's a, I mean, it's a great song, but especially oh, um, as a conceptual. They told me it used to have words and all this shit, but th- then when Bruce came up with that version, they said, that's it. It's it's so it's so good. And it's on a record that's, you know, that record's amazing, but it's a pretty serious record. And then you got, you got this, <laughs> you got this song. <laughs> it's great. I love that stuff, man. <laughs> uh, so then, all right. I know you put that up against a song like Sacrifice. But, you know, in a way, they do live in the same world. They're st- yeah. still, you know, people wondering out loud, thinking out loud. That's the way I always think of the Flipper guys, thinking out loud. All the dudes from those days. Yeah. A lot of interesting personalities and people thinking out loud. Yep. No, that's it's totally true. It's you know, we covered you last time we talked. Uh, you covered all the Stooges stuff pretty, pretty adequately. I, I love to hear. I, I love that that there's the um that that stuff that you're doing though with the like what are they seven inches singles. I don't even know at this point. Right, right. Well, what it is is what we did was for each of those tribute instrumentals, yeah. we do an A side and a B side, but then we would make a third mix that no one heard. It's the whole thing together. Oh, really? Really? Okay. Right. right. The A side and the B side, like one big song. And what we're going to do is when we get five of them, we're going to do a fifth one. We will fall. And after five, we're going to make an album of the long versions. That's awesome. (laughs) Well, you know, uh, me and Larry, you know, we were lucky enough to play with the the guys in the band. And we just love Stooges music. You see Iggy has a new record? They just, they just announced well, it. Well, right now he's out on Larry Muller. He does. He yeah. made a re- uh, record with an uh, uh, England guy who lives here now yeah. in SoCal. It's called- I think he's got my last name. Uh, yeah, yeah, his name's Watt, too. Yeah, you're, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if we're related. Okay, but he has got a new record like this. But Larry, right now, he's out helping Nick Cave on uh, Bad Seat Tour. No kidding. Really? Wow. And drums. Yeah, the, the guy... Uh, original Bad Sea guys got cancer and stuff, so Larry's taken over. Larry goes way back with them. La- Larry did all the '90s gigs with Ig, all the solo gigs. Yeah, with uh, uh, like Naughty Little Doggy and all that, or uh... Uh, right, American Caesar. Yeah, yeah, yes. oh. records. Yeah, okay. Naughty Little Doggy. Not, not my so, some of those. Uh, not my favorite work of his, but respect. You know, is. <laughs> you know, Lou Reed had records like growing up in public. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, all right, man. <laughs> right. Sure, whatever. So joystick, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, Jesus. Okay, whatever, man. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, they're, 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 their life's a journey, right? Yeah. Well, and, and hell, at least he still did. I, I thought that record Ig did with um, Josh uh, at. At Dave's place. Oh yeah, I saw that. Ig had me see him at the at the Greek, and it was really good. I thought it ripped. In, in fact, no Stooges. It was they opened with Sister Migna. There was a lot of idiot stuff in that new album. Yeah, man. That's I thought that it was, was really good. That that record I thought blew Josh me away. Was a real good band. I had on my show Saturday yesterday Matt Sweeney who played bass on that band. Love Sweeney. I've been wanting to get him on this show, man. That's an interesting dude. I love Chavez. I love all of the the stuff he brings to all the the acts he's in. Like he's a real interesting guy, man. I'll flow you his email address. I I love that. I I'm, I actually have that queued up to listen to later this afternoon. I was like, oh crap, I got to check okay. this out, Sweeney. Yeah, interesting cat. He's, he's a buddy of a, a, he's a good buddy of my friend Dave Pajo too. Um, he's gonna make a oh I got to play with him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> It was Lance Bang's 50th B Day? I saw the, I saw the pictures. I, I, I it made my okay, heart okay. hurt. Yeah, that it couldn't and be there. I played a, a G- and David Yell, a Jesus Lizard song with and he, the his uh, drummer man when he was a uh, Slink guy, a uh, Brit. Brit, yeah, right, Louisville. Yeah, that's a uh, Paho is such a he's such a sweet dude. Really, nice guy, really sweet guy. Monster player. He's really. going to be on the show in a couple of weeks here. Uh, you know, I asked him if. He'd make an album with me and him and Britt. And he said, Britt, don't want to make an album, but maybe one day David will. I mean, <laughs> I'd listen. I'm there. I, you know, I'll, you, 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 take my money. 
<laughs> you know, good. It's just all about people. It's people knowing each other and wanting to play with each other. I think yeah. this is like when you said alchemy. I think there's something about ke- the chemistry. Yeah. Yeah, that's a it, it's it's a trip how it all fits together. Yeah. So how did so how did that thing all, that Lance put together all come together? He just be like, hey, I'm doing this thing. I, I mean, you know, and I I I knew of David, you know, and stuff. He says, do you want to play with him and stuff? And I said, yeah. For one thing, I'd do anything for Lance. He's just a great cat. He's helped me out a few things. Uh, a younger man and stuff, but you wouldn't know it. I mean, that's the trip about the movement, you know. Everybody above driving age is like kind of equal. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Um, like you look it's at people. Like yeah, it's it's no, no big old divides like when I was more younger, man. And uh, so yeah, he gave me the GO, and so yeah. I mean, there's there's folks that like, you know, in their in their fifties, and uh, the, and it's like, oh Jesus, dude, you look like you're in your late thirties still. There's something about like this kind of music that kind of gives you a vitality, I think, and it's it kind of yeah. matters uh, less, you know. And then Marshall Allen, right, Sun Ra guy, he's he's in his nineties and he's still torn. That's the <laughs> that, oh, you that know. blows my mind, man. You got you got to make it. You got to get your stuff correct. But I think that's healthy. That's a healthy thing. I think that's the way we can get back into like kind of the mentor. You know, older guys playing with younger guys that got lost with rock and roll because they was marketing rock and roll as young music. Yeah. When rock and roll ain't just young music, rock and roll is just wild music. And less younger guys can do that too. I think Mick Jagger's 79 now. Yeah, that's, that's, but it's, I, but then also what I, what I like, and you know, and he's still he's still doing it. Uh, what I like so much about it, and what's inspiring to me, is that like, okay, so now we get to see what happens when punk rock ages, right? Like, how does it change? How does the intensity change? How does it stay the same? Uh, yeah. How do you continue to get these ideas across to be real, to to be very real about what you're doing, and yeah. and still make it worthwhile? Because you know that, you know, one thing about punk rock, you know, with some with some exceptions, usually bullshit is not a uh, accepted <laughs> it's, it's like all right whatever so you got your mind open and sincerely believe everybody's got something to teach you because just because yeah. you came before a long time ago you know if you don't put yourself in challenging situations or, or like things that kind of promote the classroom kind of thing where people are going to learn stuff including the people you know doing the music you're going to just do Flogging the dead horse karaoke machine, you know? Right, right. We got enough of that shit. And, and in fact, that's an old tradition that's fucking lame. Fonzie, Potsy. Who wants to fucking end up like that? Those guys look 50 years old. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. High schoolers, sure. You know, I'm going to go out there and play, you know, play the hits. Yeah. You know, for, you know, whatever. Just because you want to service a lifestyle, that's not very musical. That's not very artistic. Well, and it's to me, it's cool to see. Okay, now we get to see what happens when, when folks get older. They come from this mindset, but like you don't like. Why should you have to stop? You're still doing good stuff. Like why stop? Like this. Oh, Black got a new record, right? I don't even think he calls it Dwarves. I think he, uh, some yeah. Rick Champagne kind of shit. You know? Yeah, yeah. We saw Black. We, me and kind of t- stuff. There's all kinds of dudes from the older days trying stuff, you know, instead of just, you know, Fonzie Potsy, you know. <laughs> I remember when that fucking show came on, my pop said, those were not happy days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're happy days if you're a white dude, maybe. You know, revisionism is just bullshit. Yeah, that 1950s you know, it's, stuff. Yeah. It's limbo and right-wing talk radio trying to rewrite the Vietnam War. That's what it is. You know, but they do it on another level. Oh, we're going to dress up like, you know, whatever 1980 and 1981 and i i don't know i don't know it, it's kind of kind of uh, i can understand uh things being documented and you know they could check that out and stuff but these the next shift should be free enough to like invent their own way of interpreting the trip right you know and halloween's fine you know and it proves yeah it's proof that we, you know, usually wear costumes. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, we don't have to put all our eggs in that fucking basket. <laughs> right, exactly. It, it, they have to live like that. 
<laughs> have people. And, and believe me, Conan, I can't even believe that people talk seriously music with punk rockers because in those days, man, so-called, and especially the arena rock guys, they hated us so bad. Yeah. And to have somebody to talk serious to, to you about music and they don't care that you did that or you do that or you were emotional about that or you changed your name to that funny way or wore that funny haircut or they have no problem with that. Yeah. I'd never thought that was going to happen. I am so grateful in a way, but it don't stop there. We still got to always be bold with trying to create, I think. A hundred percent. I mean, it's, why, why would you, why would you stop? It's, it's, right. it's, 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 and not, not just be contrary, but you know, just let the freak flag fly. Speaking of which, I mean, I, I gotta say, and we talked about real early on, I was, I was so honored that you had me on your show, uh, and game respect game, like that, that's a good show. And like, you got it, you got a good ethos for it. You've been doing that for a while too. When, when did you, when did you start up doing that? 21 years, seven months. 21 years, seven months. It was in the middle of May of 2001. Yeah, man. Respect, because it's... Now, before that, I was doing a couple years at KBLT, right up in Silver Lake. That was over the air, low-power FM. But the FCC shut it down. But then uh, I was on tour, and these guys, friends of mine, had started a web uh, hosting company up in Portland, Oregon. They said, what? You'll be even to hear... The Watt for Pedro show in Pedro, if we put it on server here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's changed forms. Because I'd never been on that side of the microphone, Conan. <laughs> I'd always been the one being talked to. And so when I did it, it was actually Keith Morris going on a circle jerk tour, and he asked me to substitute for him. So we got uh, Keith Morris to blame for the Watt from Pedro show. <laughs> well, that's my fault with that, because all them cats were from Silver Lake. And once you got a couple miles away from Silver Lake, you couldn't hear the show anymore. Right. Yeah. No, that's and that's it's it's crazy because now people just accept, oh, podcasting. Sure, I know what that is. You know, great. I'll I never use that word. But you know what didn't even exist uh, as a lady, word, yeah. <laughs> the lady the lady whose apartment that show was at, her name was Paige, and she wrote a book called Forty Watts from Nowhere. Oh. She writes about that whole adventure. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I'll check that out. Yeah, yeah, it really was. She donated her fucking whole life. Have these people come in to do their shows. And that that was over the air, you know. But it's the same idea. Well, it's a radio show you without know? the radio is what it is. <laughs> That's right, that. right, right, right. But what it is is each cat who ran their show had their own world. It wasn't like some program director said, hey, we're all playing this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and that's the beauty of that's the format, right? Because you can have – well, remember that's what happened with college radio it wasn't like that at first it was yeah. like you know i remember because the sst guys had me calling up the stations these guys were playing journey and shit because they wanted jobs right from college being corporate pawns you know and then it changed and all of a sudden every dj had his own trip it was like having your own band yeah and it's i i, I was thinking about it and there's not a lot of folks at your level that have, have, have uh, you know, done this work, playing bands, making records, tour, and all that, that take the time not only just to do a show, but also to, you know, you dig up people like myself, right? You dig up folks that you think people yeah. ought to know, not just folks that people do uh, know. You know. You know what the template is? It's the fancy. Of course. And yes. I think the template on the internet was websites. That was the template. It was fanzines. You got no filter, no middleman. You like what this cat's doing, you write about him. He wants to come play your town. Your band's probably going to open up. He's going to conk at your pad. You're going to give him an interview for the zine. Yep. I mean, it's that simple. It's that nuts and bolts, you know? And that's, I mean, that's hell, man. That's how I operate this show. <laughs> but, like, but I feel like. Okay. Okay. That's common ground. Yeah. Here's a link to that book. Oh, awesome! I'll t- I will ch- I will check that out, dude. Okay. Link to that book that Paige wrote. Right, that sounds right up my alley. Get time- out. But see, see, so so, what are we talking about? We're talking about kind of aesthetics, of course. That's the artistic part. But we're also talking about ethics. Yeah. You know, you don't want. You know what? You know what I mean. You want to get your hands dirty with the art that you're involved with. You don't want to have it curated, maybe. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's what I, what I think is so beautiful about this format is that it's the barrier of entry of it is lower. Like there's there's fewer gatekeepers, right? So you can just make your thing, and you know, absolutely, you can just you know, but what hang up your shingle. Here we are. We're doing our thing over here. You know, come on by, and it's led to, and, and look, there's a lot of shows that you know it's not for me, right? That that are out there, but there are some where where I mean, when I made this no, show, Cody, it's sort of like the pocket knife. The art in the pocket knife ain't the knife itself. It's what's to be carved with that knife. Yes. Yeah, you ain't going to like everything. Yeah. But some cat might whittle you up something that you really dig. You want to see him doing it again. Absolutely. And it's when I made this show, I just was like, I was making the kind of show I wanted to hear. That's all it was. Just like yeah. with music, you know, trying to make the kind of music yeah. I wanted to hear. I think that's the tradition we want to get going. Yeah. I it's agree. not like some kind of meme thing where you copy people's act, you know, copy their face, facial hair, or stupid, you know. No, it's <laughs> it's the mo. It's like, oh yeah, he wrote used he wrote a book using words. That's about as far as I'll copy. After that, I'm going to try to be original. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, yeah, totally. I think you the same thing with your show, 100%. and I'm trying to do the same thing with my show. What helps is having interesting guests that make interesting art themselves. Sure, man. Uh, I mean, I just yeah. last uh, I, I just on Thursday. Right, if you try to cook with chow that's kind of rotted. Yeah, don't take so good. Yeah. I, I just had uh, you know Jerry Casali of Devo. He's been he's been on my show. Oh wow, that's the bass man. Yeah, he's been he's been on like three or four times, and he's a dude that like I mean he's always just you know surprising no one, just next level intelligent and interesting. And, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful guy, beautiful inspiration. Yeah, and it's that I mean that band is so important to me too. Just like every, everything they did, like even even the big swings that didn't connect, just having like the bravery just to follow your vision and. Sure, and, sure. And do it. And, and, and it's part of Mark, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, 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 so it's when folks like that trust me to like, to, to talk to them and to, to know it's going to be good, it's like, you know, that's a huge vote of confidence. It means you're doing something right, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it means it wasn't just a fucking fad. It's a living, living, breathing way of doing things. Like I said, it ain't, you know, dressing up like Fonzie and Potsy. <laughs> just to get back to happy days for a hot minute. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, no, we're using, yeah, this thing's kind of old timey. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's a vehicle. It ain't the end of the ride. It's a means to an end. Yeah. That's all that stuff matters. And, and thinking Paul about Whitman it matters. Paul putting out Leaves of Grass in 1855. DIY puts it out himself. He writes 12 poems trying to stop the Civil War. I mean, why should that go old fashioned? Yeah, it was from 150 years ago or something, but so fucking what? Yeah, it's. it's uh, I'm it's, doing things. This is what's hard to get at people because people, they want some kind of shortcut on the truth. There ain't no shortcut on the truth, but there are little step ladders on how to try to get up on jive shit and try to look over the wall of jive, the pile of jive. So you can try to see something that might look interesting that you might want to get involved with. I kind of think of it like, you know, you see a big pond, right? And you throw throw yeah. a rock in, you know, you skip, yeah. skip a rock. You see like there's ripples. It ripples out right. and it starts off small. It gets bigger. It gets bigger. The ripples right. each concentric circles. And that's how I think how all that st this stuff is, if you, if you think about it that yeah. way. Like it, it, it all, even if it doesn't hit right then and there. It still matters. Flipper's a great example, right? I feel like that's, Flipper kind of found their their people on a much larger level later on. You know, some bands even more so. But like, it, you it remember all matters. Vincent, Vincent sells only one painting. Yes, one painting, four hundred francs. <sighs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes painting, there's no justice. Some cats make nothing in their life. Yeah, but man. But that don't. That art was wasted because maybe down the road, it'll be some incredible ammunition, uh, fuel to, to light some fucking incredible fires. And yeah, I think about that band from Detroit, that band Death that they. Uh, that, that, Whoa, that, yeah, I love those cats. It's so good, and like that was you know I was like, hey, you guys ever hear this? This is great. Check it out. <laughs> I think their sons ended up playing their music. Yeah. yeah um, oh, uh, uh, what? Uh, 
I know the name of the band. It's I'm blanking on it though. Um, that, that's great too. It's a, a Rough Francis. Rough Francis, I think, if I, if I remember right. Oh, Rough Francis. Okay, because I thought some of the death. Because I thought they lost one of the death guys. They they did. Uh, the the well, the guitar player passed on before this resurgence, but they got um, uh. Is it his cousin or like a friend? I can't remember exactly. Um, Somebody in the family, though. Yeah, I yeah. thought it was a son. But you're right about that rough Francis. That that's the kids actually take over the band. Yeah, isn't that great? I love that. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. That, that's kind of that thing I was talking about, you know, handing down stuff. That used to happen a lot more in the arts. Yeah. And yeah. maybe it'll get around again because we won't get this ageism. Because they marketed rock and roll with this ageist thing for so long. To sell and it. I think that's over with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To sell it as like, oh, it's youth music. It's it's like young people's yeah. music. And it's, right. it's not serious music if, you know, once you turn a certain age and you've got a family and a house. and all, all Like 79-year-old Mick Jagger. <laughs> right, right, exactly. That makes <laughs> That's just the way it is. He could still, you know, get in Keith. You yeah. know, they can get out there and rock and roll it. Damn right. Yeah, it's uh, I it's cool to see that changing and and see like the grinding wheels slowly Absolutely. start to change for uh, people. Well, like when I did that tour three years ago, and the, the drummer was seven months short of forty years younger than me. <laughs> me and Georgie D. Boom went to high school with his daddy. That's crazy. <laughs> that's that's crazy. That's kind of cool in a way. Why can't I play? With Why the not, man? Younger? Why yeah. not, dude? Yeah, like I'm gonna be uh. You know, I'm, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be 45 tomorrow. Tomorrow, Whoa. at the time of this recording, this is the fourth. This is Sunday the fourth that we're recording this. Okay. Uh, and you know, I I play with with cats that are younger, play with cats that are older, and you know what you know what matters? Not the age. You know, it, it's just oh, what, it's what you're bringing to it. <laughs> it's playing. I think that's really healthy, Conan. I, I mean, because you're either and the way I look at it, right? You're either you're either built for it in some way or you're not and if you if you are then trying to like be like oh so and so uh so and so is too old or so and so is too young they don't have the, the life experience whatever screw it man like those those rules don't matter as far as i'm concerned i agree i agree you know especially on the bass man somebody just starting can fucking write a bitch in bass line because less is more with bass exactly it's more it's it's almost yeah, it's more about the feel. Right? That bass line that Tina and the Talking Heads did for the Psycho Killer. Ah, so it's one of the all-time but great bass lines. Jerry, Jerry, we were talking about Jerry and Devo. He wrote some Econo bass oh, lines. Oh, so good. Mongoloid. Love it. Yes. Uh, it's, yes, agreed. <laughs> That's easy. And and it's it's not, yeah, it's not that, like, it's the amount of notes you play. It's it's how you play it and where it fits in and, and how it serves the song. That's right. That's right. Aiden and Abet. Mike Watt, so awesome to talk to you, man. Anytime, every time. You can all come over whenever you want me, Conan. And same with you and my show. I, I'm I'm ready, willing, and able. <laughs> get some, you told me when you get some new music, you want to come. So bring. I'll, I'll hit you up. A mainstream stop valve. The the new. But what's this new record? Called? I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry. I usually have this in front of me. Geta, Keltner, and Watt. Every when we go. Every when we go, and that's that's coming out. So depending on when you're listening to this, it may already be out. About two weeks ago. Two weeks. Oh, you're right. Yeah, because I I delayed this. My bad. Okay. I think so, it came okay. out on the 18th of November. So go get that. Uh, check it. It's cool, man. It's 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 a cool band. Like, and it's different. It hits different, and I and I I, I dig that. And I dig that you. You're... Know what's, probably the next Watt release is this opera I just did with Petra Hayden. Love Petra. It's 50 parts called Planet Chernobyl. This old beat poet named Charlie Plymel in Cherry Valley, New York, wrote this poem. Fifteen parts, me and Petra just bass. I played my Hofner Beetle bass from China, 250 bucks. Petra on singing, mandolin, and violin. That's it. It's really econo, and it is a trip. We did it all by trade and files, and uh, that'll be the next Watt thing coming. Love to hear it. Um, okay. Love, love, love to talk to you about it, get. my brother. Okay. You too, safe seas. Love you, Conan. Mm -hmm. You too, Watt. Take care, brother. There he goes. Mr. Mike Watt, the, the unimitable Mr. Mike Watt. What a, what a what a fantastic guy. What an inspiration, right? Like it's uh 
I value his time. I didn't even get a chance, chance to tell him that I value his time. But, uh, yeah, it, it won't be three years before we talk to that guy again. Um, he's he's just, it's just too much to cover, right? right? So, But anyway, uh, yeah, so new mainstream stop valve and uh, new new Watt record coming as well. Uh, let's listen. Let's, let's listen to Mike Vigata, Jim Keltner, and Mr. Mike Watt, my guest for Digital Tier Song right now. Thank you. 
Yank it out. Got fooled by the fake ending. That was Yank It Out. Mike Vigata, Jim Keltner, and Mr. Mike Watt, my guest for today. Before that, we had Every When We Go, title track to the record, Every When We Go, available. Mike Vigata, B-A-G-G-E-T-T-A, dot bandcamp dot com. Real cool record, man. Real interesting record. Super cool. Not mainstream stop valve. Uh, main steam stop valve, sorry. Not mainstream stop valve, as I said like two or three times. They're not going by that name anymore. Uh, but same dudes. This is uh, more of a collab record. Real cool. Real cool. There's a limited edition 12 inch vinyl record. Foil stamped, numbered pressing of 500. I'm attacking Mr. Mike Bagata later this week for the next episode. There you go. Mike Watt. So much awesome music coming from Mike Watt. It's. Um, I would say it's overwhelming. It's not overwhelming. It's it's wonderful. Uh, and I think that's... Uh, look, what can I say? He's one of the dudes that I look as a template for how to do it and continue to grow and change and, and challenge yourself. And Cool guy, man. Cool guy. So there you go. That was... Mike Watt. And uh, this was Proton Reversal, episode 314. Are we going? Thank you very much for listening to it. Of course, all the archives, always free, ProtonicReversal.com. No ads, no sponsors, no kidding. If you do like the show, want to support it, and want to get episodes sooner, $1 a month at Patreon.com slash ProtonicReversal. We'll assist with that. It, it actually it does help. As we come to the close of, our broadcast day. of course, sharing the sh- episodes around the uh, social media, just emailing them to people that like it, whatever. All that helps the show as well. Thanks so much for folks doing that. If you, as cheese balls, it is reviews matter a lot. Mr. and Mrs. America. In the world of uh, podcasting. So if you want to uh, rate it five stars on iTunes, Spotify, if you can figure out how to do that, any of that stuff. All that stuff helps. It's, it's appreciated deeply. Helps people find the show. I've got a uh, bunch bunch of good episodes coming up. Secret Friends Touring is done for the year, except for one show in Chicago on the 30th. So going to be back at it. Some good, really cool stuff coming up. So stay tuned, and I appreciate you. Appreciate all the listening. This microphone turns sound into electricity. And you know, stay safe out there. Can you hear me now? Check you later. Out on Route 128, in the dark and lonely. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now?
Welcome to my top ten. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the, it's the end of radio. The last announcer plays the last record. The last what? Leaves the transmitter. Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now? Broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. Can you hear? 